Welcome to my YouTube channel, The Hidden Octave. In this video essay, we will be exploring the Ardra Nakshatra narrative, how it starts and where it ends. Every nakshatra is full of so many expressions and some of them seemingly contradictory that, as a means of understanding them all, I came up with the idea of organizing all of their expressions into a story, showing us its origins, setting, characters, conflict, resolution, and of course, the plot that carries it through. Again, I should repeat that this idea of fitting all of the nakshatra's expressions into a narrative is not an established concept, but simply a tool I have conceived to facilitate our understanding. Though I have divided this video into only three chapters, each chapter covering its own expression, all nakshatras have an almost innumerable number of expressions that is near impossible to publish in a text or video, so please not let yourselves be limited by what you see presented in this video. Though my astrology services are currently unavailable, if you find yourself in search of answers to pending questions in your life, in regards to career, romance, and general direction in life, then please book a tarot reading with me. Also, if you'd like to know more about astrology and the occult, have access to some of the most unique and interesting insights on the matter, and to support me in my journey, then please join my Patreon. For 2,000 years, the church has rained oppression and atrocity upon mankind, crushed passion and idea alike, all in the name of their walking God. Proof of Jesus' mortality can bring an end to all that suffering drive this church of lies to its knees. The living air must be revealed. Jesus must be shown for what he was. Not miraculous, simply man. The dark con can be exposed. Mankind can, finally, be set free. And we can do it, Robert. In this first part of the narrative, we will explore Ardra as it attempts to separate itself from God. This god does not have to be good or divine, but instead represents any force of stagnation, a force that keeps man and his intellect and appetite in chains, keeping him from going forward. First, let us consider Rudra, the deity of Ardra, and the role it holds in creation. The first tale we will reference is that of Brahma and his relationship with his daughter. Brahma, the creator god of the Trimutri, created his daughter Shatarupa, but then began to lust after her and desired to keep her with him. The daughter, appalled and frightened, refused this and tried her best to run from him, but struggled in her current form. So she assumed the form she believed could best facilitate her escape, that of a deer. But for every new position she galloped to, Brahma grew a new head to catch her, dividing his singular head into five separate heads, one for each of the four directions and the last to the heavens above. But then Rudra rose in a fury, and in his wish to fulfill the wish of the deer, to set her free, cut off Brahma's fifth head, the head that connected the four directions to the celestial realms above, allowing the deer to enter into and get lost into the terrestrial realms of earth, where she was no longer at risk of being grasped and restrained. Of course, the four directions relate to the four directions of earth and the material plane. The deer can be said to represent man's intellect. Chandra, the moon, is said to have a deer or deer-like animal as his mount. The mount of a deity is the force that it dominates and represents how it operates in movement within the material. The mind is ruled by two elements, air and water, and the body is also ruled by two elements, fire and earth. Water and earth are the passive halves of their respective pairs, and fire and air are the active. The body without earth would have no form, as earth is what gives shape, volume, and dimension to the body, being the element of matter. But fire is what gives animation to the body, and is what allows it to move. Fire burns earth as fuel to mobilize the body. As the element of fire operates that of earth, so does air that of water. The deeper mind is water. It is our deeper soma. It is peaceful but profoundly contemplative and spiritual. But what aggravates the deeper pool of water is the chaotic waves on the surface, 
provoked by the element of air, the elements of a million and one new thoughts and ideas that agitate the mental pools, creating ripples of new impressions that evolve into waves. These are the waves of the unmanifest plane that wash upon the shores of manifestation and from which foam creation. Chandra, the moon, is itself represented by water, but the fickle deer, Chandra's mount, represents the distractions and restlessness of the air elements. The water of mind is the deeper consciousness, but the air of mind is superficial consciousness. We even see the deer in Shiva symbolism. In one of his hands, we see a deer attempting to leap away, but its legs are held back by Shiva. Shiva himself is the god of yoga, and yoga is described as the cessation of thoughts, so the deer being held back is to show Shiva's ability to completely stop thoughts and calm the intellect. When Rudra came in to cut off Brahma's head and set free the deer, he was setting free the superficial consciousness such that it could descend deeper onto earth. Brahma created earth. Earth was still resting on God's palms. It was Rudra that wished for the freedom of this mind to go wherever it pleased and so he cut off God's grip from the earth. What we will explore in this first part of the essay, this first chapter, is the many ways Ardra sets man free to allow their wild minds to go wherever they please with no one to stop them. First, we will observe the trap from which Ardra wishes to set us free. We can use the example of George Orwell with both Ardra's Sun and Ardra Moon and his famous work 1984. To the past or to the future, to an age when thought is free, from the age of Big Brother, from the age of the thought police, from a dead man. Greetings. In it, there is a secret totalitarian force, one of them called the party and the other referred to as Big Brother, that have total control over the world and its civilians, robbing all peoples of their freedoms and subjugating them under their rule. For example, the party brutally purges out anyone who does not fully conform to their regime using the thought police and constant surveillance through telescreens, there are two ways. Cameras and hidden microphones are also other tools that they use to both surveil and control their civilians. Those who fall out of favor with the party become unpersons, disappearing with all evidence of their existence destroyed. In the story, this totalitarian power is so controlling that it even restricts language and it denies its civilians the power to define things as they see it. In this world, these totalitarian forces have a monopoly even on reality. Other ways of destroying individuality and keeping the mass consciousness solely focused on the party is by annihilating the basic family structure through destroying orgasms, for example. I just want to finish by saying a few words about the impact of this imminent neurological breakthrough. When the orgasm has been finally eradicated, the last remaining obstacle to the psychological acceptance of the principles of Ingsoc, uh, as applied to Artsem, will be overcome. In other words, the unorthodox tendencies towards own life, which constantly threaten the natural erosion of the family unit, will no longer have the biological support of the organism. As we all know, the biological and social stimulation of the family leads to private reflection outside party needs and to the establishment of unorthodox loyalties which can only lead to thought crime. But the introduction of Artsem combined with the neutralization of the orgasm will effectively render obsolete the family until it becomes impossible to conceptualize. Thank you.
These forces constantly brainwash the masses, speaking lies through their megaphones and televisions in an attempt to placate the people into believing that life is better than it actually is. The main character of the book, Winston Smith, is depicted as first hating the party and wishing for freedom from the hidden strings and constricting powers of Big Brother, and even joins an enemy organization to rebel against it. But in the book, he ultimately fails in establishing any real rebellious movement. In the movie, also released in 1984, the main character, Winston Smith, is played by Ardra Moon native John Hurt. 1984 fully depicts the Ardra Nakshatra nightmare having their individuality and freedom totally denied them. But in this section, we will observe how Ardra attempts to rebel against these forces that rob freedom from the people. In The Da Vinci Code, written by Ardra's son native, Dan Brown, we see a common expression of Ardra's wish for human freedom by desecrating religiosity. Throughout the movie, we are exposed to stories, some factually true and others made up for fictional purposes, about the supposed true origins of key biblical figures, most especially Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene, that completely contradict what is known of the Bible. But many of these true tales are not widely known, not least because there was no proof convincing enough to substantiate them. But through the adventures of the characters, they finally discover something that could essentially destroy the Catholic Church and their many lies that for so long had held man back from completely pursuing his innovations and desires, pressuring him instead to be hypocritically pious and overly circumspect. We see one character in particular, T-Big, that operates like the Ardra Nakshatra archetype that cuts off Brahma's head. He really embodies the anger of Ardra towards all establishments, in this case the Catholic Church that represses man. The living air must be revealed. Jesus must be shown from what he was, not miraculous, simply man, the dark con, can be exposed. Mankind can, finally, be set free, and we can do it, Robert. There are some real-life examples of this attempt of Ardor to set man free that I would like to explore. David Icke, Ardor Moon native, a British writer and public speaker who has devoted himself since 1990 to researching who and what is really controlling the world? In simple terms, there is a predator race which take a reptile, reptilian form. They're feeding off humanity. They've turned humanity into a slave race. They demand human sacrifice. That's where Satanism comes in. They feed off human energy, particularly feed off the energy of children. He is a passionate denunciate of what he sees as totalitarian trends in the modern world, a position that has been described as New Age conspiracism. At the heart of Ike's theories is the view that the world is ruled by a secret group called the Global Elites or Illuminati, which he has linked to the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, an anti-Semitic hoax. But this is why lockdown has been instigated, not to protect health, load of nonsense, but to destroy independent business, independent employment and independent livelihood who has benefited from lockdown? Amazon, Facebook, now all these major corporations have phenomenally increased their wealth and, and market share, while genuine entrepreneurs in the small businesses and the medium businesses and even the bigger businesses that are not cult owned have been sitting in their homes on the lockdown. And, and the, uh, I know this from my own uh, books that you know, sent around the world, the container shipping industry, which business course depends upon, is in bloody chaos. And, and what is happening? Because of it, the prices are going through the roof. The prices of fuel is going up. The price of energy is going up. This is the big squeeze to push people into the lower echelons of the Hunger Games society, so they become dependent on the state, for the basics of survival, and dependency equals control. All these things, all these dots connect if you know where we're being taken. So again, David Icke's purpose behind exposing these truths is to help free man from his invisible shackles. 
This is what the painting is. This is the original of the front cover of my last book, Human Race, Get Off Your Knees, The Lion Sleeps No More. And uh, I, I asked my great friend, uh, an artist called um, uh, Neil Haig, to paint this picture for me with particularly those eyes. And that's humanity saying, no more, enough. No more little me, we're not having it anymore. What we need is not compliance, we need a non-comply dance. Where we beat to a different drum and we dance to a different drum. Where we refuse to acquiesce to this control system that seeks to enslave us even more than it already has. Non-comply dance. Do this comply. No. No. Enough. It's time to fly. It's time to fly. Thank you very much. Of course, Ardra being a rather intellectual Nakshatra argues even academically for the necessity of a degree of anarchy resisting the hold of any power whatsoever, be they religious or governmental or even intellectual. We have the example of Henry David Thoreau, Ardra's son, who is known for his essay titled Civil Disobedience, an argument for individual resistance to civil government in moral opposition to an unjust state. He was a lifelong abolitionist, delivering lectures that attacked the fugitive slave law while praising the writings of Wendell Phillips and defending the abolitionist John Brown. The truth is a tool often used by the Ardra native to set man free from his shackles of oppression, and the Ardra archetype is often portrayed as defiance. So we are observing now the more positive expression of Ardra's destructive nature, wielding the sword of truth to tear asunder the black curtains of ignorance. We have the example of Thomas Sowell, Ardra's son, who is a relatively well-known intellectual in academic circles, but one considered a little bit controversial for contradicting some of the more dominant leftist narratives of the last several decades. For example, in his book, Black Rednecks and White Liberals, he expresses how it is the culture of the American black community that keeps it economically and otherwise disadvantaged, giving arguments as to why the black community was actually much stronger and much more stable before governmental interventions based on leftist policies like affirmative action. He even argues that the manner of speaking, often called the black sense, did not actually originate from black people themselves, but in fact originates from white redneck culture. And these same white rednecks get their manner of speaking from the poor and uneducated locations of their place of origin, which is England. One of Thomas Sowell's objectives with his published work is the emancipation of the black man from the shackles of governmental forces that claim to want the best for him, but that secretly and purposely disenfranchise him for their own corrupt gain. He claims the US government's seemingly altruistic efforts are but a ploy to keep the black man enslaved to it, worsening their plights to always earn their votes. Liberals have wreaked more havoc on blacks than the supposed legacy of slavery they talk about. Yes. You don't mean that hyperbolically. No, I do not. In 1960, which would be almost 100 years after the end of slavery, 22% right. of black kids grew up in homes with only one parent. Just 22%? Yes. Four out of five were in homes with both parents. Yes. Uh, 30 years later, after the liberal welfare state, that number had more than tripled. And so I say, well, let us compare. If, if we, we can speculate on how much that 22% was due to the legacy of slavery. But we know that that tripling was not due to the legacy of slavery. It was due to the legacy of a whole different set of policies. And you can, and, and you can look at it so many other ways. Uh, education. Uh, Stuyvesant High School in New York, as you know, you get into only by passing a very tough exam. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2012, the percentage of black students who had gotten into Stuyvesant High School was less than one-tenth of the percentage of black students who had gotten into Stuyvesant High School 33 years earlier. I didn't know that. What the welfare system and other kinds of governmental programs are doing is paying people to fail. Insofar as they fail, they receive the money. Insofar as they succeed, even to a moderate extent, the money is taken away. This is even extended into the school systems where they will give money to schools with low scores. 
uh, insofar as the school improves its education, the money is taken away so that you are subsidizing people to fail in their own private lives and become more dependent upon the handouts. Uh, there's not a predestined amount of teenage pregnancy. I grew up in an era when people, and particularly blacks, were a lot poorer than today, faced a lot more discrimination than today, and in which the teenage pregnancy rate was a lot lower than today. I don't believe there is a predestined amount of teenage pregnancy, a predestined amount of husband desertion. Uh, the, uh, Gutman has done a study of the black family showing that this whole notion that this is, the black family has always been disintegrating, that that is nonsense, that his, his studies go up to 1925, the great bulk of black families were intact, two-parent families up through 1925, and going all the way back through the era of slavery. So it is now only within our own time that we suddenly see this inevitable tragedy which the welfare system says it's going to rush into solve, but which it is itself a part. He ridicules liberals and leftists that consider themselves educated and compassionate and accuses them of possessing a subtle, condescending racism towards the blacks they claim to wish to help. His published works expose many unknown facts about society. In this first chapter, we are discovering Ardra's accusatory nature, his role as the one who discovers what is deeply wrong with the world around us, selects the true culprit, and then organizes itself to destroy it as a means of setting us free from the lies that keep us back. We also have the example of the Cartoon Network program codenamed Kids Next Door, created by the likely Ardra Moon native Thomas Edward Warburton, better known as Mr. Warburton. The cartoon is about a secret organization constructed for the purpose of rebelling against the totalitarian rule of the adult society. Father is most unsatisfied. I am most unsatisfied. Yes, Father. At first, those kids next door were a minor nuisance. That's why I entrusted you with their destruction. But because of your failures, they constantly interfere with my schemes to have adults rule the world. They employ various technologies and strategies to eliminate homework, long school hours, detention, and other tools the oppressive adult society used to enslave children. Their mission is the protection and liberation of all children under the age of 13. My fellow kids next door. It's been an honor battling adult tyranny by your side. I'd like to say I'll remember you all forever. But as you know, my decommissioning will erase all memories of your brave exploits and our fun times together. So let me just thank each and every one of you for the best years of my life. Kids Next Door rules! Kids Next Door rules! Their villains personify the greed of the corporate world, the strictness and limitations of parenting, and all other experiences imposed upon children as they age. Actually, the origin story of the cartoon goes even deeper. According to its legend, once upon a time, it was children who had created adults, and it was children that had enslaved them. But one day, the adults themselves decided to rebel. In the beginning, there were children, and for a time, it was pretty cool. The kids played on the beaches, explored the wild forests, and relaxed in the fields. The world was their big, endless playground. Thus did children decide to create adults in their own image. Only fatter, funnier looking, and bigger, so they could reach cereal boxes on high shelves. The children dressed the adults in stupid outfits so they could laugh at them and gave them goofy names like Mr. Ploppet. The adults, loyal and eager to please, worked tirelessly to do the children's bidding, making them peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, cleaning up all of their messes. And yet, the adults got no respect from children. Adults worked endlessly around the clock to keep this seemingly impossible vision while still keeping up with their cooking, lawn mowing, and attending to their children's whims, like playing horsey. Help! Woo, woo, 
It was not long before seeds of dissent took root. Mr. Wigglestein, he was the first of his kind to rise up against children. Pressed to the point of madness by his child's constant whining, Mr. Wigglestein finally snapped. In a blind rage, he grabbed the child and rapidly paddled his bottom with his hand. This new, rather stingy act was from then on called spanking, and forever changed the relationship between kids and adults. children's unwarranted attack, the adults decided the children needed what they called the Big Time Out. Afterwards, the adults created places to imprison children called schools, where they drained out all of our memories so that we forget we created them. And if that wasn't bad enough, they invented homework and after-school activities to control us even more. It's a lie! Everything you know is a lie! This is no. So the origin story flips the narrative of the present dynamic, whereas presently it is children rebelling against adults' tyranny. Originally, it was adults wishing for freedom under children's tyranny. There are some parallels that we can see between Codename Kids Next Door and the work of George Orwell. One way of enslaving people is, of course, mentally. When one possesses a monopoly on reality, and when one imposes one's idea of reality upon others, this is a form of manipulation. We see this in 1984. When the powers that be rob from the civilian the ability to define things for themselves and even rob from them the ability to have a hold on objective reality. Do you remember writing in your diary, freedom is the freedom to say two plus two equals four? Yes. How many fingers am I holding up, Miss? Four. And if the party says there are not four, but five, then how many? No. That's no use. You're lying. How many fingers, please? One example of this is when at first the totalitarian regime says that they are at war with one nation, Eurasia, but then when it becomes politically favorable for them, they gaslight the civilians and change the newspapers into promoting a false fact, that they were at war with East Asia and that Eurasia had always been their friend. In 1984, none of the newspapers print the truth. They only print whatever is politically favorable to the regime. There is no such thing as history, as the totalitarian regime invents history at a whim and changes it as per convenience. This is one of the reasons some civilians end up keeping secret diaries, where they record their own understanding of events as a mean of getting a stable hold on reality. But of course, the regime considers this treacherous, punishable by death, because anyone who attempts to get a hold of objective reality threatens their false narrative. This is also why, stereotypically, ardor tends to be against religion and religious institutions, as these institutions are often accused of attempting to rob the individual of objective reality and instead are more interested in imposing upon the individual their own construction of reality as a means of controlling them. The air element in general is about division, but ardor specifically relates to division where the consciousness of one is seemingly divorced from the consciousness of the other, 
And so ardor resists imposition and desires to hold on to its own ideas. One's own ideas, of course, being representative of one's individuality and subjective experience. The tale of Rudra cutting off Brahma's head to allow the freedom of the active intellect, symbolized by the deer, can be compared to the story of Adam and Eve. The freedom of thoughts and movement that Rudra offers Brahma's daughter is comparable to the freedom the serpent offers Eve. In some interpretations, the serpent need not be an evil force, but instead one that grants the secret wish of emancipation that already exists within Eve. How curious, then, that ardor natives are drawn to the symbol of taking a bite off the biblical apple. We have the example of the Apple Company, which was co-founded by Steve Wozniak, Ronald Wayne, who was himself an ardor moon, and Steve Jobs, who had his K2 in ardor. And K2, in any placement, is said to bring out its raw qualities without error if the native leans upon them. Ronald Wayne, an Ardor Moon native, designed the first Apple logo, which featured an illustration of Isaac Newton sitting against a tree reading a book with a single glowing apple hovering above him. Isaac Newton himself had his moon in Ardor and has his own alleged relationship with the apple. Legend has it that Isaac Newton formulated the gravitational theory in 1665 or 1666 after watching an apple fall and then asking himself why the apple fell straight down rather than sideways or even upwards. So even with him, we find the apple associated with the gain of knowledge. So, the Apple Company, especially in its earlier years, was advertised as a revolutionary brand for the young and adventurous. It was so effective that one can only speculate that it was Steve drawing from his K2 placement. In this first chapter, we will observe one very important expression of Ardor's destructive nature, and this is the destruction of disruption, the introduction of novelty that totally destabilizes the society and industry and the status quo. Examples of how Steve Jobs' Apple was destructive are its key slogans that define their early marketing, like Think Different and I think, therefore, I Mac. Apple Computers was often juxtaposed against IBM, the former being unique and avant-garde, and the latter being stuffy and conventional and symbolizing the established regime. And Steve Jobs, of course, helped to promote this narrative. In his 1983 Apple keynote address, Steve Jobs read the following story before showcasing a preview of his famous commercial inspired by the work of Ardor Sun and Moon, George Orwell, 1984. In the words of Steve Jobs, the keynote reads, It is now 1984. It appears IBM wants it all. Apple is perceived to be the only hope to offer IBM a run for its money. Dealers initially welcoming IBM with open arms now fear an IBM-dominated and controlled future. They are increasingly turning back to Apple as the only force that can ensure their future freedom. IBM wants it all and is aiming its guns on its last obstacle to industry control, Apple. Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry, the entire information age? Was George Orwell right about 1984? Reading about how the culture responded to Steve Jobs' Apple again reaffirms his having tapped into his K2 in art replacements. Examples of this include Byte Magazine, which in the year 1984 stated that there are two kinds of people in the world. People who say Apple isn't just a company, it's a cause, and people who say Apple isn't a cause, it's just a company. Apple is two guys in a garage undertaking the mission of bringing computing power, once reserved for big corporations, to ordinary individuals with ordinary budgets. The company's growth from two guys to a billion dollar corporation exemplifies the American dream. Even as a large corporation, Apple plays David to IBM's Goliath and thus has a sympathetic role in that myth. Other examples of ardor natives resonating with the biblical Apple symbolism are Dan Brown, again in his story, The Da Vinci Code. In the tale, there is a secret scroll that could only be unlocked with a code. And in the end of the movie, we find out that the code is actually the word Apple. There was every orb conceivable on that tomb except one. 
the orb which fell from the heavens and inspired Newton's life's work, work that incurred the wrath of the church until his dying day. A-P-P-L-E. Apple. Then we have the cult French movie, Chocolat, based on a story by Joan Harris, who is herself an Ardra's son. The movie was directed by Lasse Hallström, who is likely an Ardra moon depending on birth time, and it stars as the key Ardra archetype, Juliette Binoche, who has her ascendant in Ardra nakshatra, according to her AA rated birth time. In the movie, chocolate is used instead of apples. But here, the chocolate satisfies the same purpose, that of offering freedom and liberation from the oppressive forces of society. In the movie, chocolates and the sensuality surrounding them are depicted as a forbidden treat like the apple is in the Garden of Eden. Upon the Ardra archetype, played by Juliette Binoche, is projected a similar revulsion and mistrust as what is often projected upon the serpent in the garden. But really, her only intention in this small French village in which she finds herself is once again the freedom of its peoples. Freedom from their own personally imposed restrictions that keep them miserable and freedom from the oppressive chains of their highly judgmental but hypocritical society. And of course, we have the concept of the red pill and blue pill, another direct reference to the biblical apple, which is a famous scene from The Matrix, written and directed by the Wachowski sisters, and Lana Wachowski has her son in Ardra. So of course, one tongue-in-cheek interpretation of the biblical apple is that the forbidden fruit was not really hanging off a tree at a distance, but is meant to symbolize sexual experience. And likewise, as Ardra has a fascination for the biblical apple symbol, which offers others freedom, Ardra is also involved in promoting the eating of the sexually forbidden apple in campaigning for alternative sexual preferences. I have found that different nakshatras have their own sexual inclinations, some accepted by society, some not accepted, and some almost universally condemned, at least openly. In my research, I have not found Ardra natives directly associated with male homosexuality, but interestingly, I have found their influence in pushing for freedoms for not only homosexuals, but other divergent sexual proclivities. I will start off by referencing what is believed to be the first pro-gay film in the world, the German film, Different from the Others. This film was produced during the Weimar Republic and was first released in 1919. The story was co-written by Richard Oswald, who had his K2 in Ardra, and possibly Ardra Moon native Max Fassbender, who acted as cinematographer. In classic Ardra fashion, the film was intended as a polemic against the then-current laws under Germany's paragraph 175, which made homosexuality a criminal offense. There was a lot of pushback from the general society against this film. Censorship laws were enacted in reaction to it and others like it. And by October 1920, only doctors and medical researchers could view it. Other historical figures in promoting the freedom of expression of homosexuals include Henry Gerber, who was an early homosexual rights activist in the United States. Gerber founded the Society for Human Rights in 1924, the nation's first known homosexual organization and Friendship and Freedom, the first known American homosexual publication. SHR was short-lived as police arrested several of its members shortly after it incorporated. Although embittered by his experiences, Gerber maintained contacts within the fledgling homophile movement of the 1950s and continued to agitate for the rights of homosexuals. Other noted LGBT figures in history are, and please excuse me for the pronouncing of his last name, Guy Hokengeng, often called the father of queer theory. He has written and directed movies about homosexuality, most notably Has Dep, Ep, which is short for Pd, which is Paris street slang for homosexual, 
is a four-part French film that argues that gay liberation was not born in the 60s, but instead had its roots in the mid-19th century. Ho King Zheng was a prominent member of the Front Homosexuel d'Action Révolutionnaire, or in English, the Homosexual Front for Revolutionary Action, and in fact, some sources say he was even the leader of this organization. The FHAR are known for having given radical visibility to the homosexuals during the 1970s in the wake of the student and proletarian uprising of 1968. Guy Hoking Zheng is also noted for his involvement in the May 1968 student rebellion in France. The unrest began with a series of far-left student occupation protests against capitalism, consumerism, and American imperialism as well as traditional institutions. Heavy police repression of the protesters led France's trade union confederation, which spread far more quickly than expected to involve 11 million workers, more than 22% of the population of France at that time. The involvement was characterized by spontaneous and decentralized wildcat disposition. This created a contrast and at times even conflict internally amongst the trade unions and the parties of the left. It was the largest general strike ever attempted in France, and the first nationwide wildcat general strike. The rebellion is recorded to have commenced in the 2nd of May of 1968, when the moon was transiting over Ardra Nakshatra. Ardra is not only involved in promoting the forbidden fruit of homosexuality, but even the forbidden fruit of other alternative sexual preferences like bestiality. This is not to compare bestiality to homosexuality, as they are, of course, not the same thing. Examples of bestiality being a fascination for Ardra Nakshatra are Jean Cocteau, Ardra's son, and his version of Beauty and the Beast, a clear representation of love for a wild animal. We have the controversial movie Wedding Throw, directed by Thierry Zenon, who is likely an Ardra Moon which possibly depicts sexual acts with farm animals like pigs and other zoophilic acts. We have Josh Whedon and Ardra's son that depicts human and vampires having sex as well as humans having sex with giant praying mantises and demons and the like from his early show Buffy the Vampire Slayer from the 90s. So other interesting facts linking Ardra Nakshatra to the liberation of gays and lesbians is the 1969 Stonewall riots when New York City police raided the Stonewall Inn, a gay club located in Greenwich Village in New York City. The Stonewall riots served as a catalyst for the gay rights movement in the United States and around the world. This happened in the early hours of June 28th of 1969 when the sun was stationed in Ardra Nakshatra and Rahu was transitioning Purva Bhadrapada. And both Ardra and Purva Bhadrapada are connected to freedom from control. Of course, it's curious to study historic events and the transits during those times because they are suggestive of the general atmosphere descended upon a collective. Astrologers use dates to suggest when particular activities are favorable or unfavorable because the astral atmosphere may or may not be conducive to its success. In fact, the very reason why Pride Month, a month celebrating the rights of homosexual individuals, is held in the month of June is in recognition of these Stonewall rights. And June, of course, is the month where the sun transits over Ardra. On the subject of dates, I have found some key revolutions in history occurred or were at least triggered when the luminaries were transitioning over Ardra, again illustrating the intensity of the desire for individual freedom. We have the Young Turk Revolution. Now, the event that triggered the revolution was a meeting in the Baltic port of Reval between Edward VII of the United Kingdom and Nicholas II of Russia in June 1908, when the luminaries were transiting over Ardra and when Rahu was also in Ardra. There are other historic days of rebellion, like the Boston Massacre, which occurred in colonial Massachusetts. Of course, the Boston Massacre uh, is said to have paved the way for the American Revolution. The Boston Massacre is recorded to have occurred on the night of March the 5th of 1770, when the moon was in Ardra and when the sun was in Purva Bhadrapada. Then we have the New York City draft riots, which began July 13 and ended in July 16 of 1863 when the moon was transiting over Adra. 
We also have other dates of historical revolutions that, according to historians, is not recorded to have started when the luminaries were in Adra, but the dates are very close, and they may have actually been triggered when the luminaries were transiting over Ardra, but performed later. The French Revolution, which actually followed the storming of the Bastille. Bastille was an event that occurred in Paris, France on the 14th of July of 1789, when revolutionaries stormed and seized control of the medieval army fortress and political prison known as Bastille. But on the 14th of July, the sun was transiting over Punarvasu and not Arda. It is likely that the collective decision to rebel against the states started when the luminaries were in Adra, but the collective decision to reform society took place when the luminaries were in Punarvasu. So the breaking of chains was in Adra, but the force to actually bring about long-lasting societal reform was in the falling nakshatra of Punarvasu. So this marks the end of the first chapter of the Adra nakshatra narrative, or the Book of Adra. He has burned governments. He has overthrown monarchies. Now, let us observe Adra in its freedom. Chapter 2. Comedies and Tragedies So the tale of Ardra progresses. First was told of the yearning of this nakshatra to set man free. Now, in this chapter, we will explore man in his freedom. To open this chapter, we must refer to another role that Rudra, the deity of Ardra, plays in creation. The three mutris and their wives all participated in the act of creation each one with their own roles of creation, destruction, and preservation. Creation all started off as a cosmic egg, filled with wondrous forms but frozen in imagination. We say frozen for there was no active consciousness to experience it. It was a beautiful dream dreamt by Brahma, him together with his consort Sarasvati. But to release the egg from its frozen state would require the burning force of penetration want to shatter the shells of the egg to let flow out the yoke of creation. It was Rudra and his consort Uma who split open the oval, who cut themselves into Brahma's egg, giving life to his dream by entering into his created reality. This splitting the egg and entering into it is reminiscent of biting into the apple and entering into the altered reality that can only be granted by the apple. If life is like an apple, or an egg, or a piece of cake dreamt by Brahma, then Rudra, the devourer, is he who eats it piece by piece. What we will observe in this chapter is that the destruction of Rudra is not only that of ending creation, but is also the destruction of taking bites off of the fruit of life. Again, destroying life by eating it bite by bite. It is the destruction of experience, living life and experiencing life physically, emotionally, and intellectually. Being the nakshatra that wishes to enter into earth, it suffers from a hunger for life and experience, the foods and exotic trips of this vast new world, the grand and untested ideas of his chaotic mind. For the sake of conciseness, I will not be exploring every aspect of this adventurous chapter. Instead, I will focus on the joys and sorrows, the comedies and tragedies of Ardra in relation to romance, specifically the film and literary category of the romantic tragedy. A romantic tragedy is a love story categorized by intense highs and despondent lows. Of its common themes are those of forbidden love and also the death of one or both of the lovers. I have decided to speak of love because love defines what all or most people wish to experience in this material plane. In one's dynamic with one's beloved are experienced all of life's joys and sorrows. Love is the ultimate fruit of experience and so a worthy subject of study to understand the Ardra narrative. Let us begin with Shakespeare himself, regarded as the king of tragedies, who had his Ketu in the very nakshatra of tragedies, Adra Nakshatra. Of course, a famous example of this is Romeo and Juliet, a tale of two star-crossed lovers whose respective families are tied in a never-ending feud against one another. Today, the title characters are regarded as archetypal young lovers.
The fundamentals of the story remain the same, almost regardless of adaptation. A summary of the famous play reads as follows. An age-old vendetta between two powerful families erupts into bloodshed. A young lovesick Romeo Montag falls instantly in love with Juliet Capulet, who is due to marry her father's choice, the county Paris. But Juliet, of course, meets Romeo and they fall so totally and helplessly in love with one another that Juliet now wishes to escape with him. With the help of Juliet's nurse, the women arrange for the couple to marry the next day, but Romeo's attempt to halt a street fight leads to the death of Juliet's own cousin, Tybalt, for which Romeo is banished. In a desperate attempt to be reunited with Romeo, Juliet involves herself in a plot and fakes her own death. But for this, she had to inform her lover, Romeo, who had been exiled from Verona, lest he actually believes she has died. Juliet arranges to send a messenger to Romeo so that he is made aware of this scheme. But the message fails to reach Romeo, and believing Juliet to be dead, he takes his own life over her tomb. Juliet, at this point of the story, being buried as part of her ploy, wakes to find Romeo's corpse beside her. And in her anguish, Juliet decides to take her own life as well. All other examples I will show will follow the same vein. Other of Shakespeare's plays that involve great love that end in misery are Othello. The play features a couple, one of them foreign, a moor of dark skin, and the other a beautiful maiden of high social standing, her name being Desdemona, the daughter of a Venetian senator. Though the moor himself is of some social standing, being a military commander who is serving as a general of the Venetian army, it is implied by some of the characters, like Desdemona's father, that because of his ethnic background, he is an unfit husband. Othello and Desdemona are madly in love with one another. They show each other great kindness and charity and consideration and understanding. Their union seems so pure and so innocent. But of course, the reader, being familiar with the style of Shakespeare, is sat on the edge of his seat biting his nails in anticipation of the imminent doom that is sure to loom over these two lovers. This doom takes the form of Iago, the vindictive antagonist of the story, and operating like a snake in grass, he begins to sow dissension. I follow him to serve my turn upon him. I am not what I am. Hmm? How? I have it. It is engendered. Hell and night must bring this monstrous birth to the world's light. Through his lying and stealing and plotting, he deceives Othello into thinking that his beloved Desdemona has been unfaithful to him. In a jealous fury, Othello kills Desdemona and then ultimately kills himself. Other famous romantic tragedies include Titanic, the director of which is James Cameron, who also had his K2 in Ardra. This too is a tale of lovers from very different posts in society, but who defy convention and socially impose expectation and pursue a romantic affair with one another, taking a bite of the forbidden fruit and pursuing an ill-fated love affair. Neither one of them had ever experienced a love as deep, as all-encompassing, as fiery, as lively. But the flame of romance is soon snuffed by the ice waters of the North Atlantic Ocean. 
the movie ends with the crash of the ship against an iceberg. One of the most iconic scenes depicts Jack's last act of love, that of sacrifice. The waters of the North Atlantic Ocean are freezing and so could kill anyone after a short time. Jack and Rose's only life raft is a piece of wooden debris that is capable of carrying only one of them. Rose insists in trying their odds and begs Jack to crawl onto the piece of wood, but Jack accepts his own death if it means that Rose's life will be spared. Another romantic tragedy is that directed by Josh Whedon for his show Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Josh Whedon has his son in Ardra. The romance of Buffy the main character and Angel the vampire is a little more of a slow burner but the story is parallel to the previous ones explored. Two people, a vampire and a vampire slayer, whose destinies are opposed to one another as the former is the natural prey to the latter, but struggle against their feelings for a while before they give in to the forbidden fruit that is their love. Breaking boundaries to go after what one wishes. But because of their opposing positions, this relationship was doomed from the start. Angel is different from other vampires in that he possesses a soul. But there is a caveat. He loses his soul and reverts back to the state of a bloodthirsty vampire if he allows himself to experience even just one moment of pure happiness. Angel one day experiences this when he and Buffy sleep together. This tale wonderfully depicts the duality of Ardra's tears, which are the tears of both joy and sorrow or rather, joy that inevitably leads to sorrow. As the greater the former, the more dejecting the latter. When Angel loses his soul after having experienced bliss through his union with Buffy, he begins to act very differently. This is because he now has reverted back into the state of a vampire beast. And in so doing, he breaks Buffy's heart. Three words. Eight letters. Say it, and I'm yours. Bye. Gossip Girl's Chuck and Blair are another parallel tale. The book upon which the series is based was written by Ardra Sun native Cecily Von Zeigzar. And Chuck Bass, the character we will be exploring, is portrayed by Ed Westwick, who himself is an Ardra Sun native. This story is slightly different in that both the characters come from very similar backgrounds. Wealthy, Upper East Side young adults who live extravagantly. Throughout the seasons, we see how deeply they love each other, but how this love frightens them. For they sense the dares will end in romantic tragedy. Chuck, aren't you done trying to destroy my night? I was scared. I was scared that if we spend the whole summer together, just us, you see. See what? Me. Look, I should never have abandoned you. I knew I made the wrong decision as soon as your plane took off. Distracted myself all summer. Hoping I wouldn't feel it, but I still do. What are you doing here then? You were right. 
I was a coward running away again. Everywhere I went, you caught up with me. So I had to come back. You've hurt me too many times. You can believe me this time. I love you too. Actually, throughout the show, we see moments where they madly and freely give themselves to one another, and how kind and generous and even innocent the relationship is at times. But each time they get together, their relationship ends horribly, either because the vulnerability required for the union scares them into distancing themselves, or because their respective cruel and selfish natures clash. At different points in the series, it is signaled that Chuck Bass is even at the brink of suicide because of the intense love that he has for Blair has been poisoned into profound despondency and he is left empty, cynical, and drowning in a whirlpool of whiskey and depression. His most unforgivable act was when he, in believing Blair would never return to him, goes to bed with her worst enemy. Excuse my confusion, I didn't expect to see you tonight, or ever again. You went. I'm sorry, I was so late. I waited. I wasn't going to show up. I was resolved not to. Every bone in my body tried to slow me. Every voice in my head screamed, don't. But I didn't listen. I followed my heart because I love you. I can't deny that our path has been complicated, but in the end, love makes everything simple. I am so sorry for the pain I've caused you. And I know I can't take it back, but I want to try and make it up to you. Even if it takes me the rest of my life. There. Will you? <coughs> you tell her. Blair, I, I thought you didn't love me anymore. I didn't care if I lived or died. Jenny Humphrey was- Don't, don't say your name! Or anything else to me, ever again. You. Get out of here now. Go, and never come back. Because if you ever set foot in Manhattan again, I will know. And I will destroy you. Love Story is another romantic tragedy of the 1970s, starring Ryan O'Neill with an AA verified birth time that places his ascendant in Ardra Nakshatra. This movie again tells the story of two very different people from very different backgrounds breaking boundaries to be with one another, but ultimately being punished for it. Ryan O'Neill's character, Oliver Beard IV, is heir of an American upper-class East Coast family and attends Harvard College where he plays ice hockey. He meets Jennifer Cavallari who is actually working class, and they quickly fall in love with one another. But Oliver's family does not approve, so much so that they threaten to cut Oliver off financially if he dares marry Jennifer. And you are rebelling, Oliver. I failed. I failed to see how marrying a beautiful and brilliant Radcliffe girl constitutes rebellion. If you marry her now, I'll not give you the time of day. Father, you don't know the time of day. In defiance of his family, they get married, but life is hard without financial support. Later, when they try to start a family and struggle to conceive, the doctors inform Oliver that Jennifer is terminally ill. But Jennifer herself does not know this until she confronts her doctors. In the end, she dies on a hospital bed, 
and her last wish to her grief-stricken husband is to be embraced. So there are three tarot cards that are easily correlated to Ardra Nakshatra, two of which I will reveal here. These are the Three of Cups and the Three of Swords, both of them depicting the highs and lows of experience, the joys and sorrows, the comedies and the tragedies of life on earth. Romantic tragedies also relate to another tale of Rudra, though in this tale, Rudra is often interchanged with his aspect as Shiva. But in studying the Puranas, one concludes that Rudra is the aspect of Shiva within the womb of creation, and Shiva is the aspect of Rudra outside of material manifestation. So the name differs in context. The story is that of Shiva and Sati. Shiva is the god of yoga, and as such, he can never be disturbed or agitated. But only Sati and her beauty could arouse him and wake him from his meditative states. Theirs was an impassioned love story, but Sati's father, Daksha, did not approve of Shiva, and in some versions of the tale, Sati married Shiva against her own father's wishes. Daksha's hate for Shiva goaded him into shunning Shiva from an important ritual. Sati, finding herself caught between a rock and a hard place, and so overcome with sorrow from the divide between her father and her husband, killed herself by throwing herself over the sacrificial fire of this ritual. The Shiva Purana describes Shiva's grief in saying, With a terrible yell, Shiva sprang to his feet. He tore a long tuft of hair from his head. Shiva's grief was so grotesque that his own limbs contorted and bent in pain, breaking him. In a rage, Shiva sent Virabhadra to destroy Daksha's Yagna and to kill any and every god that would stand in his way. So we can see the origins of the modern-day romantic tragedy in this classic tale of Rudra's romantic tragedy with his beloved. There are many other romantic tragedies starring or directed or written or even inspired by Ardra natives with either Sun, Moon, Ascendant or even Ketu in Ardra. I shall now provide a short list. Withering Heights by Emily Bronte, Ardra Moon. The Way We Were, directed by Sidney Pollack, Ardra Sun. Atonement, written by Ian McEwan, Ardra Sun. West Side Story, which was inspired by Romeo and Juliet, the inspiration being written, of course, by the king of tragedy, Katyn Ardor native Shakespeare. Brokeback Mountain, starring Heath Ledger, and directed by Ang Lee, Katyn in Ardra. Cruel Intentions, starring Ryan Philippi, Ardra Moon. Never Let Me Go, based on the book of the same name, written by the famous author Kazuo Ishiguro, with Ketu in Ardra, and the list goes on. These tales depict Ardra's naiveness and innocence. Ardra is meant to represent one's introduction into the material plane, and thereby making oneself vulnerable to all experiences. In dividing himself from God and entering into the world, he did not realize that he would be opening himself up to experience both good and evil, the polarities of existence. These tragedies serve to help the Ardra native ask himself whether life is worth living, whether entering into life is worth all of the pain of living it. There is no way of only having blissful experiences without pain. From these tragic experiences, we can begin to branch off to the notorious cynicism of Ardra Nakshatra. To quote Pamela J. Smith, a cynic is just a wounded romantic. In exploring romantic tragedies, we see now the dual nature of Rudra's tears. Rudra's intention in splitting the egg of creation to enter into it was to live life to the fullest, but to truly live is to die. Every man is his own Rudra, as through living, he eats his own fruit of life, bite by bite. We must make reference to yet another tale of Rudra, and this is the tale of his splitting. Rudra is a god linked to the act of division, division from the creator, dividing the celestial from the terrestrial, and dividing polar opposites from one another. His divisions are what populate the earth, 
since he divided himself into two, male and female, and then into eleven, and then into countless numbers representing humanity. When we observe the eleven rudras and the meaning behind their names, we gain deeper insights into their roles. Different Puranas have different names for the eleven rudras, but the following are based on the Bhagavata Puranas. Each one of these aspects of creation represents the elements of reality that man interacts with, man's ability to perceive reality and interact with reality, and lastly, man's ability to reflect upon his experiences. So the Rudras, in this way, can be thought of as representing all of humanity, each individual having split his own egg in order to enter into the plane of his own existence, each human equipped with his own heart, mind, and senses to study life and become his own philosopher, every one of us opening ourselves up to the polarities of experience. Of the three tarot cards I have associated with this nakshatra through contemplation, the chief among them is the Lover's card. The Lover's card is generally associated with the sign of Gemini in Hermetic Kabbalah, but one can see why it would be linked with Ardra specifically. The Lover's card tells the story of Adam and Eve, and therefore the story of division. The division of an individual soul into its corresponding feminine and masculine halves, as Rudra himself divided himself, and the separation of these souls from God, thereby leaving the Garden of Eden, which can be compared to Rudra cutting off Brahma's fifth head that connected the four corners of the earth to the heavens, and then exiting the garden to enter into earth, can of course be seen as the splitting of the egg. The Lover's card is different from the Two of Cups, for instance, Whereas the former represents division, the latter represents union, the merging of two beings, the completing of a soul. Chapter 3. Is a man in chains a better man than one set free? So we are on to the third chapter where Ardra is now confronting himself to the reality of freedom. The belief that inspired Ardra to wish to break man's chains was that he is fundamentally good and self-capable. That he does not need Big Brother controlling his every move, telling him what to like, whom to associate with, and submitting his individuality to the service of the dictates of an invisible power. Ardra has eaten the apple and so believes himself and all people capable of self-governance. But in this chapter, we will observe the results of Ardra's miscalculation. As he is made to confront the demons of his own Pandora's box, or to keep with the analogy of the apple, Ardra will finally taste the fruits of its own actions. In setting man free, Adra thought man sufficiently evolved, but could it be that by breaking his chains, Adra is only speeding man's devolution? To open up this chapter, I will first refer to a story written by Guy de Maupassant, himself an Adra moon. The story in question is called Boule de Suif, or translated variously as Dumpling, Butterball, Ball of Fat. The name of the book refers to the protagonist, a prostitute whose real name is Elisabeth Rousse, she and the main characters of the book, who are all strangers to each other, decide to flee their small French town that had been recently occupied by the Prussian army. All of them find themselves in the same vehicle. The prostitute, Boule de Suif, is sat in the presence of two nuns, the nobility, and other members of the bourgeoisie. Being the prostitute, she is the one in the lowest social station. This carriage ride with its diverse passengers is meant by the author to be a microcosm of French society. At first, the other passengers look down upon the prostitutes, projecting upon her all sorts of nasty ideas, but they slowly change their minds about her when they witness her generosity. An example of this is in her sharing her picnic basket with the other travelers. 
The journey was long, and they all grew hungry, which made them all the more appreciative of this gesture. But the carriage upon which they travel is soon detained by the Prussian officers, and all the passengers are trapped indefinitely at a local inn. It is later revealed by the prostitute, Boule de Suif, that the chief officer promises to let all of them go only if the prostitute sleeps with the officer. Of course, all the passengers are appalled upon hearing this and encourage Boule de Suif to hold her ground and integrity, naturally, as they do not consider it moral for a woman to sleep with strange men for favors. They feel totally uncomfortable with this entire proposition. But the inconvenience and frustration of their imprisonment soon reveals their true hypocrisy, and they turn against her, changing their tune. Now they begin to invent reasons of morality and logic, all to goad her into having sex with the officer. The noblemen, the middle class individuals, and even the nuns all take turns in arguing the case for why she had to offer herself to the Prussians for the sake of the majority. The prostitute soon acquiesces. She goes to bed with the officer, and she and the other passengers are free to leave the next morning. One would have thought that after such a sacrifice of dignity, the other passengers would have been grateful to Boule de Suif, but instead their original contempt for her returned with a vengeance. Now back on their journey, they completely shut her out, ignoring her and carrying on polite conversation with one another as if the whole thing never happened. Even sharing food with one another, but refusing to offer any to the prostitutes, who at this point of the tale is heartbroken and is left starving and sobbing all by herself. Perhaps they ignored her because she was a representation of their own hypocrisy and faulty morals, and looking at her would have been like looking in a mirror. Perhaps by ostracizing her, they could better maintain the illusion of superior morals. Whereas in the first chapter, Adra was concerned with exposing the tyranny of the invisible forces that chain man, in this last chapter, Adra's focus is on man himself and finally realizing him as the true evil. Was Adra wrong all along for letting man loose? Is man not the evolved spirit Adra once thought? In this last chapter, we will look at another meaning behind Adra's tears. The tears of regret. With this story as our introduction, we may now speak about evil. The created world is one of polarity. To have one thing necessarily means to have its opposites. By dividing ourselves from the one divine, Adra has necessarily created the conditions for evil. Throughout this last chapter, we will touch lightly upon the many expressions of man's evil, all of which the Adra native attempts to expose and even destroy to rectify its own mistakes. Next, there is the famous story by Adra's son native, Franz Kafka, and his book, Metamorphosis. Gregor Samsa, the protagonist, is the only one who supports his family financially. His entire family is dependent upon him and put a lot of pressure on his back to work, inventing many reasons as to why it is they cannot support themselves and how badly they needed him, and yet they do not treat him very well. Gregor himself begins to feel taken advantage of and deeply underappreciated, and these internal feelings fully reflect themselves in his physical appearance when one day he wakes up to find himself transformed into a cockroach. His family is appalled and disgusted by him, locking him in his room so he never escapes. If before he was mistreated by only his father, now he was universally scorned and rejected. His family resented him even more when they realized that they would have to start supporting themselves and they each got a job. So now, not only did they reject him, but no longer had they any need for him. Gregor, the son turned cockroach, is deeply wounded by this ingratitude, the contempt, the betrayal, and the plain hate expressed by his family members, and soon dies from a broken heart. Instead of having his death trigger a moment of introspection, his family simply sighs, grateful to be finally rid of him. It is clear to the readers of the book that Gregor's family members were always capable of supporting themselves but chose not to out of laziness and instead hurled all responsibilities of their survival upon Gregor. 
making him the mule and making him the scapegoat for their current state of poverty. So another interesting theme is that of scapegoating, because it is Adra that goaded man to eat of the apple of good and evil and to escape into earth and away from God. It is Adra too that is blamed for all of the consequences of this eating of the apple. Adra natives enjoy creating conditions that force man to rear his ugly head, again as a means of exposing him and accusing him. One interesting example of this is the show Big Brother. The name itself is inspired by George Orwell's book, 1984, and George Orwell was himself an Adra son and Adra moon. The creator of Big Brother, John DeMole, is an Adra ascendant, according to his A-verified birth time. The show is really a study of all the main themes of Adra. Betrayal, deception, shifting blame and responsibility, as well as other expressions of human evil. In the show, contestants of various personalities, ideological beliefs, and the like are placed into a house. The objective of the game is to win a large cash prize, but to do so, all other members of the house must be voted out. What makes the show interesting are all of the relationships that are formed that at times even seem genuine, but are often calculated as the show operates a little bit like a popularity contest. In order to win, Contestants lie to one another, make up stories of other members, spread vicious gossip, betray one another, etc. All to eliminate the other contestants so they can win the cash prize. We have Vanessa Russo. Oh, Vanessa, a truly generational strategic talent. She had everything that it took to be an all-time villain. Her gameplay was ruthless, her emotional manipulation worked wonders, and she was damn good at the game. She'd backstab you without a second thought and then align with your closest ally five seconds after you walk out the door. The format of the show Big Brother is reminiscent of the ending of the movie 1984. In the movie, a couple get together and begin to break the rules of the totalitarian society they live under. This is another Adra romantic tragedy trope because they fall deeply in love with one another and they begin to regard one another as the only thing worth living for in this bleak world they are in. But one day they are caught and then are tortured in separate rooms. The one man, Winston, begs and begs those torturing him to let him go, but they refuse to. But only when Winston betrays Julia, his lover, by totally scapegoating her and telling the officers that they can take her instead of him, do the officers finally set him free. I press the second and the door of the cage will slide up. These starving brutes will shoot at you like bullets. Have you ever seen a rat leap through the air? They will leap onto your face and bore straight into it. Sometimes they attack the eyes first. Sometimes they burrow through the cheeks and devour it. In Betraying Julia, it is as if he has killed her, and in this way their love is dead. What one finds in many Adra works is the use of scarcity to bring out man's evil. In life, people tend to behave well when all their needs are met, but act much more selfishly and exploitatively when they see themselves as lacking. In many literary works and movies, one finds Adra making use of people in difficult situations whether financial or emotional, or what have you, as a way of revealing the hidden evil within man. Part of the reason the Adra native so ferociously accuses man and criticizes him is to accelerate his moral evolution, 
because unless he evolves and learns goodness for his own self, he will be forced back into totalitarian shackles out of necessity so that he does not destroy himself from his own corruption. Whereas before, Adra wished for freedom from the constraints of government or society or religion, in this final chapter, he begins to understand that actually, the very reason such systems exist is because man refuses to take accountability for his own actions, and perhaps because he is incapable of good on his own. In order to truly change and evolve, man must accept himself as he is. But scapegoating is really his greatest sin because now he absolves himself of his duty. And this frustrates the Adra native who, once again, feels pressured into accusing man even more violently and forcing him to see himself for who he is. Adra is one of the main nakshatras that brings change and novelty into the world. But because of just how different and strange its ideas and contraptions, his innovations result in apples of chaos. One interesting difference between Adra and Shatabisha is the following. Shatabisha carries with it the weights of Saturn. Saturn is god of seasons, and in Western astrology, its aspect as god of agriculture is emphasized. Saturn studies its environment to know the best time to sow, to water its seeds, to plow, etc. So when Saturn is connected to innovation, the ideas of Saturn tend to stick and last and be more accepted by the general society because it first studies its environment to know the best time and way to introduce novelty. Saturn is the planet of the collective, and as such, he observes the general preferences and attitudes of the people of its time, the same way a farmer would observe his animals to know the best time to feed them or to mate them for the success of his farm. This is also why Saturn is connected to trends, because it senses the seasons, or in this case, the changing tendencies of the collective. Adra is wilder than Shatabisha and operates individually instead of collectively, and so the novelty of Adra more often provokes fear and confusion because it does not read the room as successfully as Shatabisha. And so it introduces novelty when the world may not be ready for it. Some examples of these Adra innovations or truths that are met with resistance and sometimes ingratitude include feminism. Described as the advocacy of women's rights on the ground of the equality of the sexes. Now, because the history of feminism is set to date far before the 20th century with many figures, it was hard for me in my individual research to find singular figures in the movement that I could hold disproportionately responsible for its championship. But I am including it in this Adra video because the idea of feminism as this disruptive and revolutionary change in society fits the Adra theme. Although there are many good things that come as a result of feminism, it is often blamed for making society more degenerate in certain ways. So to show how Adra is the one who both offers the food but also accuses, or in this case, is involved in the feminist and anti-feminist movements, we can take the very early example of Alice Guy, who herself had her son in Adra Nakshatra. In her seven-minute movie called The Consequences of Feminism, she portrays a society where the gender roles are switched. Men act like the traditional woman and tend to children, iron clothes, clean, stay at home, and act very passively. And women take on the common male stereotypes of drinking in public, acting violently, and aggressively pursuing their counterparts. This film is representative of the pushback that Adra and its ideas receive from the rest of society because of how novel their ideas are. They provoke fear and even mockery from those around them. But what is interesting is that it is an Adra native, Alice Guy, that is mocking and ridiculing an Adra concept, feminism. This movie is clearly attempting to mock effeminate men and masculine women perceiving them as some sort of aberration. This movie, once again, expresses the contradiction of Adra's desire, both wishing for freedom, in this case, the freedom is feminism, the equality of the genders, but then crying in horror at the fruits of the freedom they had once wished for. In this case, the fruits of forcing the genders to be equal, in some people's minds, is the erasure of gender differences altogether, or even their flipping. 
A big part of the feminist movement has been the idea that men and women are the same psychologically, and the only minor differences are merely in the upper body strength. Of course, the ultimate goal of the modern day feminist movement is the equality of the sexes in all domains. This includes economic and political equality, equal access within the workplace, freedom from oppressive gender stereotypes, and finishing with an androgynous worldview. But naturally, there are many that oppose this notion, believing that indeed there are important natural differences between men and women that even explain some of the economic, political, and social discrepancies between the sexes, and so we find these other ideas challenged and even hated. One result of feminism that many hold as its logical conclusion is the acceptance of transgenderism. Transgenderism is possible within some feminist frameworks, since the two genders are regarded as completely equal, except for a few minor external characteristics. So the tree of feminism allows for the fruits of transgenderism. But as a response to this come the TERFs, or trans-exclusionary radical feminists, many of whom at one point may have agreed with some of these central tenets of feminism, like the idea that there are no important differences between men and women, but due to whatever threats transgenderism posed to them, now feel the need to adopt a set of ideas or rather revert back to a set of ideas that they feel will safeguard them and society from these ADRA contraptions. So we are seeing many of these same feminists that at one point professed that there are no important differences between men and women now change their mind when they see how far the feminist movement has gone and discovering that actually they do not agree with it. Then we have feminism combined with the sexual liberation movement, which aim to overturn traditional concepts of sex, like that it should be held within the confines of marriage. Such movements also allowed for public nudity and even pornography, but interestingly, many of the same supporters of these movements had an issue with Hugh Hefner and his Playboy magazine, saying that it exploited women. But many people find this strange because on the one hand, if one claims sex is fine and permissible, if one claims that sex work is real work and that is just as honorable as any other profession, then why all the fuss against figures like Hugh Hefner, Kim Kardashian, or any other figure or industry that sells sex and naked bodies? How do many pushers of sexual revolution and feminism condemn Hugh Hefner but praise women who willingly objectify themselves on OnlyFans, for example. What's wrong with the sexual revolution then? So my argument in the book is basically that there are some really important ways in which men and women are different from one another. So some of those differences are physical and should be fairly obvious. And my argument basically is that the sexual revolution was kicked off by the pill and the which which did a pretty good job of severing the link between sex and reproduction and it's kind of gave the impression that sex could just be a leisure activity, that it didn't have to mean anything, it could just be sort of a bit of fun. And my argument is actually that that idea that sex is just, just a bit of fun, it doesn't really mean anything, suits male interests much more than it does female because casual sex in particular is just one one, men want it more than women do, and two, women carry all of the risks associated with it, like physical risks, like pregnancy and violence and so on. Um, so my argument basically is it's a bad deal for but women. originally, it was the sort of thing that was pushed by liberals and feminists, right? This is exactly the sort it's of still, thing. Still, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, so the, the popular narrative that I'm challenging is one that the sexual revolution was like a feminist accomplishment. Um, but I think in terms of sexual culture, that I'm concerned. I'm concerned for women, I'm also concerned for men. I mean, there's a lot in the book about, for instance, the really malign influence of porn on young men. Like, Some even ask, why is workplace harassment so heavily penalized if sex is no big deal? Again, Adra playing both the giver of the apple and the accuser. I get really frustrated with feminists who claim simultaneously that um, sex work is work and that we should like get rid of all these hangups about um, selling sex being any different from working at McDonald's or you know selling any other kind of service. But then they also get so sensitive about any like perceived sexual impropriety in their workplace. What like? Like being touched by a boss, for instance, like not even in a, like a really aggressive assaulting way, but just, you know, women, 
getting touched on the arm or something like that or being asked out in a context that you don't really feel comfortable you know all that kind of me too stuff which is quite low level like if that if it's really the case that sex work is work then what is the problem with being asked by your boss to give them a blowjob right it's 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 work it's just a service it's like being asked to do overtime or make, or make a, coffee. a coffee or make a coffee yeah and no one actually thinks that that it's just like making a coffee. Then there are others that claim that these sexual revolution movements worked against some of the objectives of the feminist movement. The sexual revolution movements and its fruits allowed for greater objectification of women, which is obviously a matter of feminist fight against. Then we have those who hold the sexual revolution and homosexuality responsible for newer, those smaller movements that champion bestiality and pedophilia and other sexual inclinations considered deviant. And there are more and more and more examples of Adra being scapegoated for offering man freedom. Adra wants to push for new ideas, but the problem with novelty is that its consequences are unforeseeable and unprecedented. The fruits of novelty may be so hard to swallow that it may not even justify the novelty itself. There are many that strongly argue in favor of transgenderism, for example, but find it hard to justify those who claim to be transracial or who identify with a different species or a different age. So it's this chaos that is the fruit of many of Ardra's well-intentioned revolutionary ideas. Human intelligence is another subject of great concern to Adra. In the first chapter of this book, we saw how Adra rejected the constraints of conservatism and religion and wanted to allow the intelligence, however blasphemous, to be free to explore and invent as it wishes. But this is another source of regret for Adra when it observes the full evil or fruits of this same intelligence, how nothing is sacred to it, not God or man. Examples of this can be seen in the works of Ketun Adra native Kazuo Ishiguro, whose books really explore the reality, the reality of technological dystopia, which is of course brought about by man's untamed intellect. In his book, Never Let Me Go, he describes a world where science has advanced so far that humanity can now make full clones, but these clones are created for the sole purpose of having their organs extracted from them. Throughout the lives of these clones, Pieces of their bodies will be taken from them until finally they all die and their bodies are discarded as though their humanity had no value. This book references the concept of savior siblings. I quote the Wikipedia definition. A savior baby or savior sibling is a child who is conceived in order to provide an organ or cell transplant to a sibling that is affected with a fatal disease. Of course, this procedure is controversial. These Adra nightmares describe a reality where, where human intellect evolves faster than human ethics or physiology. Other examples of the wildness of the Adra intellect are Elon Musk, who has his son in Adra, and his companies like Neuralink that develop implantable brain machine interfaces. But again, this Adra native is feared for his innovation because many believe he is pushing for transhumanism, the merging of man and machine. Here we find again Adra creating new technologies and pushing for new ideas, but the results of which are unprecedented and many fear will end up creating much more harm than good when we finally taste these fruits. Of course, we also have many publications that study the long-term effects of social media on the collective psychology, intellect, and even physicality. Technology is the fruit of human intellect when it is given freedom to run wild, but then we modern humans turn around and scapegoat these same technologies for our current state of affliction. But we do not hold our own selves responsible for engaging with these tools. Again and again, the dynamic of the eater of the fruit and the accuser comes up. Adra sets us free and yet blames us for our own inability to govern ourselves. But we, in turn, shift the blame back to Adra in this never-ending blame game. The last tale I would like to reference that actually ties together the first chapter we explored and this last chapter is the famous book, again by George Orwell, Animal Farm. The story goes as follows. 
a helpless group of animals were enslaved by a cruel farmer. These animals, various in kind, were overworked, underfed, and vindictively castigated. This book contains elements of the tyrannical overlord that we explored in the first chapter of the Book of Adra. But one day, the animals decide to revolt, and they overthrow the farmer and run him off his own farm. We see, too, the element of revolution covered in the first chapter of this book. The animals rejoiced in their victory. But Manor Farm was theirs, and they lost no time in destroying everything that reminded them of hateful Mr. Jones. Their cruel leader had left such a bad taste in their mouths that they had collectively declared that heretofore there would be no more hierarchy. The animals reflected on how evil their former master was, but when they thought of themselves, they saw themselves as fundamentally good, gentle, and compassionate. This was one of their mistakes, for in thinking themselves fundamentally good and scapegoating all evil to their former tyrant, they were blindsided to any possible evil that could arise among them. Now free of oppression, the animals began a new era, adopting the Seven Commandments of Animalism, the most important of which was, all animals are equal. In the beginning, everything seemed idyllic. Food was plentiful, and everyone was merry. But history soon repeats itself. One of the farm animals, a pig called Napoleon, slowly begins to position himself as supreme leader. The pigs began to want special privileges, like rare foods and freedom from labor, but they wanted to benefit from the efforts of the other animals, and so, with the promise of a windmill, the pigs tricked the animals into working harder and harder with a political goad that soon their hard work will pay off, as the windmill is sure to make life easier. But the greed of their new pig leaders was never satiated. Wanting more power, they employed more political schemes, like accusing some pigs to be in collaboration with their former enemy, the evil farmer, as a way of purging the farm of dissent and avoiding a possible new rebellion. The pigs involved themselves in slave trade, plotting to sell some of the farm animals as slave labor to their neighboring farms in exchange for whiskey, even stealing the chickens' eggs and selling them in exchange for jam. Over time, Having successfully brainwashed the animal masses, the small pig collective began to transform. The pigs, through their corrupt activity and positioning themselves as superior, literally begin to take human form. In the end, the reader discovers that true evil does not exist outside oneself, but within oneself. The animals had at one point demonized the farmer, making him out to be soulless and corrupt, but really, the animals themselves were no better than the farmer. It just so happens that because the farmer was free, he had, no one, he had no one to check him when he devolved into corruption. If man is only good when he is in chains, maybe oppressive forces are not so evil. But Adra cannot accept this conclusion. But at the same time, he cannot leave man to destroy himself by his own perversions. Adra finds himself in a catch-22. Having arrived at the end of this narrative, we can explore the three-part expression of Adra's destructive nature. In terms of freedom, we can see this as the destruction necessary to set man free as the first expression. The second expression is the destruction the man himself causes when he is set free. The wildness of his intellects and innovations and desires and the damage that they ultimately cause. And the last expression of Adra's destruction is in Rudra himself having to come down and destroy man because of his corrupt nature. These musings of Adra Nakshatra call to mind the biblical tale of the flood, when the Almighty God had decided that humanity was essentially a failed experiment. After observing the depths of man's evil, and how every day man would invent a new perversion. In God's deep lamentation, the heavens wept, and the earth was flooded with sorrow which effectively wiped out the entire planet. 
I would like to thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed my video, if you enjoyed my video, then please like or comment.